Hello everyone. If you're like me, you were probably waking up this morning thinking, was that all some horrible nightmare um, last night? No, unfortunately, it wasn't. Um, it does look like the future, <laughs> if you can even call it that, of our club is still in the hands of the thieving, greedy, treacherous leeches that have been there for the last 18 years. There's a lot of questions that go unanswered because of the arrogance of the people involved in the process. I'm sure they won't give us the courtesy of answers to our questions because we don't matter to them. And they know that we're going to pour through, the not me personally, but they know that fans will pour through the turnstiles, still go to the souvenir shop, the megastore, um, and get behind the lads. So there's no reason for them to have to answer any of our questions. But Gary Neville um, on LinkedIn and on um, Twitter has asked 16 questions sums it up brilliantly for me so I'm just going to read them out what does the dist distribution of funds look like is all the cash being taken out of the club which glazes are going or is it a family delusion um, how much does it impact the New York Stock Exchange shareholders does the executive stay the same does the sporting side stay the same above the manager? Who within the board has sporting control? That's massive. Are there any few... Uh, I don't know what that one means. We're mixed, maxed out on the credit card and debt. How is this deal going to change the capital structure and financial issues the club has? It doesn't, doesn't change them at all. Is any further debt being placed on the club? It will be if he wants to keep seeking more control than it will be because he hasn't got the money to do that. Is any debt being paid off? I suspect maybe not a lot I wouldn't have thought how does this deal impact the board composition how does a minority shareholder impact the negative culture within the, the entire organization it doesn't um, unless he he does have complete sporting control then maybe maybe it does um, Old Trafford is tired and is in need of significant redevelopment how does this deal resolve this issue it doesn't will this deal allow the development of the training ground to its required standard no Old Trafford requires significant investment on its surrounding land. Does this deal impact this requirement positively or does it leave it as a concrete wasteland? It's the latter. It leaves it as a concrete wasteland. They won't put anything into the area around Old Trafford. And this last one, is, this last one absolutely nails it. How does a minority shareholder stop cultural decline across a whole organisation if the people who've overseen this decline still have a majority shareholding? Gary, absolutely nailed it with that last one the 16th question he saved the best to last I did a video on the culture of the club uh, two weeks ago and said again how do you change the culture when the people responsible for it are there not just there but making the decisions a pivotal question for me doesn't matter which one it was I was trying to find it again is um, who it's number six who within the board has sporting control um, it's not going to change anything massively because Sergio, I'm pretty sure, is sporting control at Nice and they're not pulling up any trees. But if someone different is the is the person that makes the decisions on a sporting basis, then I think that will make some difference to us. Um, th there was talk, um, I think it was last week, that they're looking into the scouting department and, and looking to change. You, know, you should always look to evolve different departments, absolutely, but they're almost suggesting that the scouting department isn't good enough. No, we can all give five, ten names that the scouting department have given to the club as recommendations that the club have ignored because the book, the book stops with that imbecile Joel Glazer who has the final decision. What's the point in having a good scouting network if that idiot's making the final decision? What's the point in potentially bringing Paul Mitchell in as the, as the director of football when Joel Glazer makes the final decisions? What was the point in Ralph Raniak? You had a guy there who essentially could tell you, he was a football expert, you knew loads about European football, about how to build a structure within a club, and you point blank ignored him and sacked him because he told you the truth. Jim Ratcliffe is a glorified Ralph Raniak. He comes in and basically does, I suppose, some orga organisational stuff within the club, I imagine, if you want sport and control. You had a guy you could have just paid whatever you were paying him per year that could have, could have done that. 
the, the obviously the good thing for the Glazers this time is that Sir Jim Ratcliffe's given them some money to do it. Those questions are bang on, and I answered most of them myself. It's very easy to answer those questions. It's not difficult at all. Sir Jim Ratcliffe has done exactly what he said he was going to do a year ago. Sorry, more than a year ago, because it was about August, September time when he was interviewed. And I'll remember, I'm, I do have to make, make this fair. At the time of the Liverpool protest, when it seemed like Sir Jim Ratcliffe was our only option, and I 100% I would have wanted him to, to come into United. And what he said at that time was, um, we we want we had a look at it, and we wouldn't mind to having a go at coming in with a, a minority state to start with, and with an idea of, of then a, a full takeover over a period of time. That's what he said in, I think it was September 2022. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's doing. Um, the the reason it's a problem now, and it wasn't maybe as much of a problem then, is we know what the alternative was. We know there was somebody who could come in and um, make us a proper football club again, and have ambitions to make us a, a club again, and completely reset everything, and take the vermin out, and completely reset the culture. You can't reset a culture when they're still there because they've set the culture like Gary Neville said. He's so right with that last point he's made. I doubt we'll get an audience with them at all, um, with the press or anything like that. They'll put a club statement out as and when they make the decision and it's all passed. But what I'd love to, to someone to ask and put them on the, um, on the back foot with is when you started this whole process in November of last year, you said that it was with, as, as always, that was the quote, as always, we're looking to get um, for the best, um, the best eventuality for the for the club and what we can do moving forward into our future. It's so something along those lines, right? I want someone to explain to me then how taking one point five billion pounds when the club needs three billion pounds spending on it in the next two or three years is better than somebody paying for the whole club, paying all the debt off pledging £1.5 billion and having infinite amounts of money to do everything that needs to be done. In the immediate future, he would have done that. How is, you, is this option better for our football club? Like I said, they're so arrogant, they, they, they won't have a press conference, they won't do anything like that, it'll just be a statement on the club website. As with everything with these scumbags, the sense of anticlimax is gut wrenching. I said it in a video ages ago. You've got a glazer option or an exciting option. If it goes with a glazer option, it's that's always the anticlimactic option. And I bring you back to an analogy I've used before, which is quite sensitive, um, and why I will walk away as improperly walk away from from this, what's in front of me now. I'm not even calling it United because it isn't United anymore. Um, we've been abused, that's the analogy. And in some ways, the loss that I feel now is not as um, pronounced because I've probably spent the last five years detaching myself slowly but surely and slowly but surely away from the club because I could see it was turning into something that I don't recognise anymore. The club itself I love dearly, but there's nothing left of it. There's memories. There's the, the stadium, there's there's the the memories of going, there's the um all the stuff that I'm lucky enough to have seen, um my own personal memories, etc. That's Manchester United. What's there now, like I said last night, is a carcass of what used to be there before. And as a fan, if I was to continue to engage with that. I'm opening myself up to be abused and I'm not going to be a person who's, who's abused. So as hard as it is, like it is for a lot of people when they're being abused, the best thing to do is to walk away. I'm not walking away from Manchester United, I'm walking away from the Glazers because you can't separate the two things, unfortunately. That's heartbreaking, but it's true. I'd feel differently if I thought I belonged to something that was trying to make a change. 
spoke to my mate earlier on today and I said, daft as this may sound, my one of my best moments supporting United in the last five years, one of my most emotional moments, was um, the day when we were supposed to play Liverpool and we got the game called off. I celebrated that evening like we'd, like we'd beaten Liverpool 5-0 because I thought to myself, at last we're doing something. At last we're doing something about it. We, we, they're, they're kicking off. They've got a game called off. That's massive. That really is. It's major to get a game called off. And I thought, it's going to snowball now. It hasn't snowballed at all. If I knew that the fan base were militant, were hostile, were planning things that really meant something, where I could say, Do you know what? I don't recognise the club anymore, but I recognise the fans that I'm a part of and I'll be a part of that culture and that community and we're all going to work hard to get the Glazers out of the club, then it wouldn't matter too much what was said yesterday because I'd, I'd feel that kinship with people. I don't feel kinship with people that can't be asked to stay outside the ground for 18 minutes before an Aston Villa game, that can't be asked to sit in the ground, that can't be asked to not go to a few games because it's too inconvenient for them or it'll cost them a few quid on a season ticket. No. Nah. The fans are complicit with this, unfortunately. And that is as difficult as the actual decision that's been made for me to accept. Because being a United fan is part of my identity. And you're never going to, with such a big fan base, be the same as all the fans. But the core, die-hard, red, proper United fans, they're, they're not. They're not, they're not because they're happy to, to placate and continue to accept this. And for me, it's completely unacceptable. I'm not sure what there is to love or like about this club because the Glazers have had the mitts, of it, mitts on it for too long. Post-Ferguson, it's been 10 years. And it's it's the clues and the trail the trails are everywhere. The stadium rotting before our eyes. The, the, the level of player that we attract to the club now, the type of player that we attract to the club the way they handle things, their lack of communication, the gaslighting of fans, putting Turkish fans in with our own home fans. I could be here all day listing what I don't like about this club and I can't tell you one thing that I like about it other than memories. I said, I said all the stuff that I said about it not making sense last night. There's no point in me repeating myself. But... Unless something does come out in the next few days where maybe the rest of the shareholders don't pass this through or, or something along those lines. We'll be interested to see what happens with the share price tomorrow. I still don't think I still think we could get something could happen. I still think something could change. Um if it doesn't, United are dead. It's done. Game over. Glazers out.